eh, simultánea y estamos muy agradecidos de poder hacer eso hoy día. Eh, estamos muy felices de poder hacer este evento aquí eh, para hablar sobre la política exterior de Estados Unidos y los efectos de eh, la elección que ocurrió anoche, los resultados de, de, de esa elección y lo que significa para eh, la política exterior de Estados Unidos hacia la región. Eh, tenemos, eh, y estoy súper feliz de tener eh, la presencia de Juan Carlos Irragorri y la gente de NTN24, Club de Prensa, grabando una edición del programa uh, aquí eh, en CSIS. Eh, para la sesión de hoy vamos a hablar de las elecciones de elections that were held yesterday. Everyone is familiar with the results in general. Now, the U.S. Senate is going to be in the hands of the Republican Party, and there are other states where things went very well for Republicans. The state of Massachusetts, which is generally a Democratic state, now has a Republican governor. Likewise, the state of Maryland. This is a state which generally goes Democratic. It now has elected a Republican governor. And there are other states as well where the results surprised many. Bearing in mind what has happened, we hope to be able to answer some questions here this morning. What does this mean for Latin America? What can we expect from the period between the elections and the taking office of the newly elected, will we see changes for important issues in the region, such as immigration, trade, the relationship with Cuba, the relationship with Venezuela. So I'd like to begin, but first I'd like to introduce the others who are with us. Uh, this morning I already mentioned our moderator, a very experienced journalist who has been recognized with the Premio Planeta, Planeta Award for Journalism of Spain. That's Juan Carlos Iragorri. Mark Bassett is the lead correspondent in Washington for the Spanish daily El País. Welcome, Jose Jaime Hernandez, my friend, and correspondent in Washington for the Mexican daily newspaper El Universal, and my very good friend, Muni Jensen, who is an analyst here at uh, CSIS, but also a political analyst with Club de Prensa. And I'm very happy to have all of you here to discuss these issues. So with that, I hand it over to you, uh, Juan Carlos. Uh, no microphone for the English. Tienes que encender tu micrófono. Sí. Ahí sí. Un momento, un momento. Espera un segundo, espera. ¿Se escucha o no? Hola, es un tema con el traductor. Aquí ¿Qué? vamos a tener una... Initially, I wanted to ask the members of the panel, what is your initial 
perception of what happened yesterday. I'd like to begin with uh, Marc Basset, who is the chief correspondent for the daily newspaper El País of Madrid, because if you read the Washington Post, the uh, headline is the Republican wave. But after these results, in which the Republican Party, which is in the opposition, not only uh, expanded its majority in the House of Representatives, but also has won 52 of the 100 seats in the Senate, the magazine The Economist began its article by saying what happened yesterday in the United States was a massacre. So the question is, was that a political massacre? Well, in part, what happened was to be expected. All of the polls had predicted that the Republican Party would win the Senate. The novelty, the surprise, are the uh, dimensions, the scale of this defeat of Obama's party. There are many points to analyze. Is that a defeat for Barack Obama? It's a defeat for de uh, the Democratic Party. Barack Obama practically didn't participate in the campaign. The Democratic ca candidates did let him appear, help him in their speeches and in their uh, election activities. Many local matters were being settled in these elections because the elections were held in the states and in the congressional districts, but it also had to do with the policy of Obama or the politics of Obama, and in that regard, that's a strong message to Obama. The question is how will he respond? Obama is now more isolated. He's more alone in the White House. Fundamentally, Washington hasn't changed. Washington has already been in legislative gridlock for four years, ever since the Republican Party won the majority in the House of Representatives. That, that lacked the key so to speak, on legislation. What might happen now is that this situation will become aggravated. It becoming aggravated is one possibility, or as the Republican Party has absolute control of both houses of Congress, another option, another hypothesis is that this might give way to the agreements that have not occurred in recent years. So yesterday's elections were more a vote to punish Barack Obama and the Democrats than a, a prize for the Republicans or rewarding the Republicans. Was that the case? Well, my Democratic friends tell me, look, the economy is improving. Unemployment is going down. Price of oil is quite low. It's going below $80 a barrel, and they still don't like Barack Obama. And my question, coming back to them, is what does the president represent. And what the president represents here is that nothing is happening in Washington. A, they want to see something happen in Washington. Uh, this can be seen from one election cycle to the next. The last two years of this term that the president has remaining is the most difficult. The same thing happened to Bill Clinton. The same thing happened to George Bush. And so now it is happening to President Obama. But what has happened here is notable because it has greater implications for the issues that we see going into the 2016 presidential election. So the people have uh, responded to the situation by rejecting what's happening in Washington, rejecting the leadership of Barack Obama, but the implications are more important for what is coming in the 2016 elections. And there we have uh, the following question. Will the Republicans be able to govern? Will they obstruct or will they be able to govern? And on the side of Obama, will Obama allow things to happen legislation-wise in order to help define his legacy? I think those are the two most important things to take note of in terms of what happened yesterday. Now, Mooney Jensen, what might the rest of the Obama administration look like having just down the street from the White House in the Capitol the, his political adversaries in charge? Well, I think this is a question that the Democrats have been asking for several, themselves for several days, ever since they knew there'd be a defeat, not perhaps as crushing as uh, occurred, but they did see that this change was coming in the majority of the Senate. Now, there are two paths that the President Obama could take now. He could do what George Bush did in the last two years of his term, which is he uh, sort of relaunched his government. He changed certain key players, such as Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld. He turned the volume down on the influence of Dick Cheney as Vice President. That is to say, he could change his government team, somehow uh, relaunch his style of government, and use executive measures, or uh, what we call decrees in Latin America, to carry out certain immigration reforms that he uh, promised he would do when it was defeated in Congress, and he would 
perhaps govern in a looser way, trying to reconstruct, or in a more relaxed way, reconstructing the uh, coalition that uh, brought him to the presidency twice. That would be too optimistic, however. I think he's going to have many difficulties, for example, uh, getting a, approvals for nominations in respect of high position, high level positions, particularly with respect to Eric Holder, the outgoing Attorney General, the uh, Secretary of Justice, as well, uh, or He's going to have difficulty, no doubt, getting an uh, immigration reform through Congress. Uh, more democratic-supported uh, issues, such as uh, educa pre early education, infrastructure projects, they'll have to wage a tough battle. Nonetheless, in the two years uh, leading up to the presidential elections, the Republicans are going to have to be very careful to not be depicted as those who obstruct everything and don't allow government to go forward. So they might have to uh, si pursue. They might pursue a more uh, proactive agenda. The presidential elections began today. Do you think that uh, the Democratic candidate, much as said of Hillary Clinton, do they have a great advantage, or would they be more at a disadvantage after what happened yesterday? Are the Republican candidates going to be much more favored? For example, Jeb Bush or Chris Christie, the governor of New Jersey? Uh, judging by uh, the real landslide, I think this raises the hurdles to whoever the uh, Democratic uh, candidate might uh, be, uh, be it Hillary Clinton or someone else. But it will be a more of an uphill campaign because this is also going to depend on the last two years of President Obama. To what point will President Obama prove capable of giving impetus to and moving forward initiatives that have just uh, been at a standstill, for example, immigration reform, that's going to be very complicated. I'm quite curious to see what next Friday's meeting at the White House is going to look like. I think this is an inevitable issue because the President had said that he was going to implement executive orders in order to carry forward, for example, the uh, program to benefit uh, parents who are undocumented, who have children who are citizens, but I think that if this, I fear that it might be seen as a uh, declaration of war by the Republican Party, and I wouldn't find it unusual if there be, if there are calls for impeachment based on abuse of presidential powers, so his room for maneuver is considerably reduced. The Democrats are going to have a very tough time with it. And one of the things that has really struck my attention has been the uh, cowardice on the part of the Democrats not wanting to hear from Obama. I think that the Democrats either have not studied history, haven't learned the lessons of history, what the Republicans are going to do in, 26, uh, in 2006. Also, the Republicans in the Great Depression with Hoover, it didn't work for them. And I think that with these experiences, I find it quite unusual that most of the Democrats have fled like cowards from the president. The electorate doesn't like that. The electorate doesn't like people who don't stand up for what they believe in. So to answer your question, I think that the Democratic Party is going to have to draw many lessons, many conclusions. They're going to have to restudy the script because I think that the result has uh, made it quite complex. It's totally rewritten the outlook. Mark Bassetz, your newspaper, El País of Madrid, has closely followed everything that has happened in Cuba recently. There were two editorials in the New York Times calling for the U.S. trade embargo in Cuba to be lifted. It, the lift began in October of 1960, since 19, uh, 64 years ago. There have been uh, several presidents of the White House, uh, Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, and so on. Uh, and many of the, the have had two terms, uh, Clinton, George Bush, and now Barack Obama. Now, yesterday in the elections, not only did the Republicans regain the majorities in the Senate, they already had the majority in the House, but they also uh, preserved the office of the governor of Florida, which is a state which has a large uh, population of Cuban origin. What do you think could happen to Washington policy vis-a-vis -vis Cuba with yesterday's results? Well, in these ye last years of the presidency, 
as you've noted, generally the president has an adverse Congress, the, and the general uh, presidents generally use these as a time for uh, conducting more foreign policy because the U.S. Constitution gives presidents much more room for maneuver in foreign policy than in domestic policy in respect of which they have practically tied. So the last years are a period during which the president can really uh, set his uh, foreign policy legacy. It has been said, and this has been uh, said in other presidencies as well, that Cuba is one way to do so because there's a general consensus on the left and the right that the current policy doesn't work. Uh, the differences are on how to change policy, but it's clear that after so many years, uh, 10 presidents, the uh, policy of the trade embargo just hasn't worked. So it would appear that uh, the stars are favorably aligned for a change of policy towards Cuba. Now, the New York Times uh, editorials, it's very interesting to see how the New York Times, a newspaper which has had these positions in the past, but now it is practically engaged in a campaign uh, for a change in U.S. policy to Cuba is one sign that th things are changing, things are uh, moving. Polls indicate that in South Florida, where most of the Cuban-American population is located, there's also a change of opinion. There are ever more fa voices in favor of relaxing the embargo, even lifting it. Some polls show a majority wanting to lift it. There are prominent figures in the Cuban-American community who have spoken out in favor of changing this policy. Uh, uh, business persons such as Van Hul, uh, voices that are heard and that have great residents in the Cuban exile uh, community. And there are also demo uh, clear demographic changes in South Florida. And the descendants of Cuban Americans are not as close to the tough, uh, to the very hard line uh, positions of those who exiled, uh, went into exile in the 1960s. All of this would suggest that there would be a change, but this takes us to the results of the elections yesterday. The fact that the Republican Party has increased its control of Congress and has been able to become the majority party in the Senate, in my opinion, makes any policy change much more difficult. It's not that the Democrats in the Senate are in favor of engaging in dialogue with the Castro brothers and becoming friends with them, but if it's a difficult it'll be uh, all the more difficult for this to happen with the Senate in Republican hands. Carl, you know the Senate Foreign Relations Committee very well. You've worked with that committee. Do you think that in these two years and two months uh, that remain of the Obama administration, that a president, not just a lame a duck president, but a defeated president would dare to sink his teeth into the whole question of the embargo? I think that the question of the embargo remains unchanged. Let's not lose sight of the fact that the chairman of the, f Dem the Democratic chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee has been Senator Menendez, who has a very clear, well-defined position of supporting the embargo. So I don't think the environment in Congress has much changed. I think that President Obama faces the same situation of having to decide whether he's going to carry out reforms by uh, executive decree, uh, executive order, or not. And as you said, I do think it's a possibility in terms of the president's legacy. Let us not forget that the president is seeking a legacy in the region. President Bush first had nine free trade agreements with the region and the Merida Initiative. President Clinton had Plan Colombia and he had the NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement. So what is the mark that Obama has left in foreign policy? This is a big question that could be worked out in the next two years. It could be Cuba. I don't know. I think it's more likely that the immigration issue will come up again uh, because it's of interest to both uh, parties to move forward on this uh, issue. The Obama administration has for a long time been saying, we want to reform the immigration system. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. And they haven't done anything. And the Republican Party clearly understands that if it is to win the presidential election, it needs a diverse group of people who go to the polls willing to vote for the Republican Party. It is not a state-level campaign or a district-level campaign. It's a national campaign. And this is the demographic that is growing more than any other. 
Well, now supposedly it's 17 percent. It's going to be in uh, 2042. It's going to be one third of the country. The Republicans understand that. So, to be able to uh, clear out, uh, check this off on the agenda, uh, is important for both parties. This might be a priority. Perhaps executive authority could be used. There is the summit of the Americas is coming in. Uh, April, Panama has invited Cuba to participate. It's likely that that will be an engine that will motivate the government of the United States to make a decision to go and talk about Cuba and talk about reform, or, or maybe not. It's not yet known. Uh, Carl has put the question of immigration policy on the table. President Barack Obama, in his second presidential campaign, lifted up immigration reform as uh, his main banner. And he said that he was going to open up a door for the 11 million undocumented in the United States, most of whom are of Mexican origin, in order to regularize their situation, legalize their situation. Not yet. It's not gone well for them. Nothing has happened. With yesterday's result, will that change? Or will things change? Uh, or will the situation for the 11 million worsen? Well, I would hold off on answering that question. For if we look at what happened in Colorado, for example, where the Latino vote did not uh, accompany uh, the Democrats, in part because uh, the president has held back on new executive orders, he preferred to sacrifice Colorado so as to benefit other Democrats. But it didn't add up for him. I think that the Democratic Party and President Ob Obama have to look at this strat their strategy on this so as to recover an electorate, which I think in large measure was lost because Hispanics or Latinos are sick and tired of them being considered a captive electorate, uh, some uh, kind of cattle that are brought out to pasture every election cycle, whether it's for the Democrats or the uh, Republicans, as Carl says. I think that the Republicans understand very well that the logic in presidential elections is completely different. The new majority in the United States are this whole set of new minorities, Hispanics, African Americans, Asian Americans, women, gays, lesbians. And I believe that the Republicans have been incapable uh, of connecting with this new map, with this new uh, multicolor, multi-religious uh, 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 hue of the United States. And this can be dealt, uh, can be uh, and this is all connected to immigration reform, to recoup uh, the illusion of these, the dreams of these uh, voters. They're going to be almost 25 million soon. And the challenge to the Republicans is to not have these extremists who continue to call immigration reform amnesty lining up on their side. And that has caused them many problems. It practically cost Mitt Romney the uh, issue of deportations practically cost him the Hispanic vote. And I think that the Hispanic community needs to regather their forces, refigure out their message. Now, I don't know if some of the Latinos in the Republican Party, such as Ted Cruz, have understood this and are willing to move on this. And the Democrats will really have to go back and touch base with this Hispanic electorate that no longer believes in them. Indeed, the Hispanic voters are uh, tending to assume ever more independent positions. So it's going to be more difficult. It's going to require more work uh, to, uh, for the Democrats to win over the love of the Latinos. But we'll see. Now, in terms of U.S.-Mexican relationships, other than on immigration, will be there any changes after yesterday's outcome? The instinct in, of the Mexican politicians are, well, I think of them like uh, somebody who's uh, behind the gate looking at the bulls. The instinct of Mexican politicians, especially in the pre, is to say, I don't really like the outcome. Why? Because the Republicans have, haven't helped so much with the whole issue of arms transfers, arms that are being sent to Mexico. They haven't honestly supported immigration reform. They've put up many obstructions on the whole uh, commercial or trade front. So high-level people who I've uh, with whom I've spoken in recent hours have told me I, we don't really like 
the outcome. But real politic means that you have to negotiate uh, with the Republican Party. There are professionals. Uh, there are good understandings. Uh, Mitch McConnell have, has very clear ideas and can have an, a strong impact in the party. But despite that, there's no doubt that Mexico, uh, that in Mexico there are many reservations and people will be waiting to see just what are the next measures and proposals that have to do first with immigration reform, second with border security, which is the uh, battle horse of the most conservative movement. And considering that the Republican Party is going to have to go through primaries, things could get very complicated. So in uh, Mexico, they're looking from uh, behind the barrier to see how things might evolve. And in terms of Colombia, what might happen after yesterday's result? For during the time of President Bill Clinton, a, a, a Democratic president with a Republican Congress, Plan Colombia was implemented, and the United States have given Colombia several billion dollars, which have been used in part to bolster the army. Recently, there's been negotiation, and a free trade agreement was approved. And even though journalists were told that uh, exports of Colombia to the United States were going to increase, but that turns out to be a lie. Exports have dropped 13% annually since that treaty went into force with Colombia. But now there's a peace process going back two years uh, between the government of President Juan Manuel Santos and the FARC. And in case that is signed, if the uh, FARC, who have committed serious crimes or crimes against humanity, are they going to be going to prison or are they going to have alternative penalties, all of which is uh, very controversial and questionable, with a Republican uh, Congress might that change, or will there continue to be unlimited support for the peace process, as Obama has said? I don't think the relationship between the United States and Colombia is going to change very much with this change in the Senate. We have already had a Congress with Republican majorities in the House of Representatives. I don't imagine that today, in 2014, there's going to be a major change. Had you asked me this question six or seven years ago, when Carl was in Congress, and when I was walking through the Congress, visiting representatives, precisely to promote the free trade agreement, I would have given you another answer. Because when we would be uh, at the end of the day, after uh, we'd sit down with Republicans and have coffee, and we would tell them Colombia is a great country, it's striking how all these members of Congress have such a positive image. Uh, yet when we'd go talk to the Democrats, we'd uh, walk out of the meeting saying, oh my God, we're human rights violators, we're a country with absolute impunity, and it would seem as though uh, the members of Congress are facing two different realities. Today, the reality is different. Uh, Colombia has taken a turn that both parties recognized. I think that it's very difficult not to support the peace process, even though one might have very serious reservations in terms of how it's to be done. What country in the world would say, we oppose a government's effort to reach uh, peace and bring ends bring an end to decades of violence. So in practice plus Colombia, uh, there's no pending issue uh, at the top of the congressional agenda. The US agenda, Colombia agenda at this time is excellent. The issues are education, technology, uh, strengthening uh, trade ties. And I believe that the views of the, both parties is different. Now, if we move to a post-conflict situation, there might be split opinions among Republicans. Many of them were very much lined up with the eight years of the Uribe administration, and they might have some misgivings as to whether or not there would be impunity in respect of the guerrillas. Carl, part of U.S. policy to Latin America has had to do with illicit drugs from the time when President Richard Nixon began to call that the war on drugs. Many people have died. Much money has been lost and so forth. I don't know if this outcome in yesterday's elections, particularly in that here in Washington, an, a ballot initiative was approved allowing people to possess up to two ounces of uh, marijuana and that they could grow plants for their own use in their home. And this has happened also in Oregon and already in Colorado, Washington. Might this send a message to Latin America that even though Obama has changed uh, some, he still resists opening up to legalization even of soft drugs. And uh, former presidents such as Cesar uh, Gaviria of Colombia, Cedillo of Mexico, Cardoso of Brazil, uh, the economist of England, all of these have called for greater uh, change in drug policy. Now, can't Washington change drug policy when in this very city people are voting in favor 
of marijuana sales and possession of marijuana. In the 1970s, when I was a child in Colombia, they would look at us Colombians as big cr criminals. And now it turns out that uh, here in Washington, you can step out and buy marijuana at the corner. I think it's a complica complex issue because, as you say, there is a federal law which is anti-legalization. And now there are laws in different states that allow for the use or sale of marijuana. Now, what's interesting in terms of our policy to the region is that so much of our policy towards the region has been based on anti-drug policy. And now we are legalizing in various states of the United States. So what are we telling people in these countries? And we've seen what's happening in Uruguay. I think that there's a law in Mexico that allows for certain limited quantities. Colombia is considering it, uh, Chile as well, and in Argentina. So what is the message that is sent to the rest of the region, but also how is U.S. foreign policy to the region viewed? I'm certain that many of my friends in the region see it as perhaps uh, hypocritic hypocritical to have a policy towards the region and have this reality here. We're going to have to deal uh, with the region and try to have a more consistent policy in this respect. But it's also important to mention, and this has to do more with the whole question of what the content of reform would be in Mexico when there's discussion of these issues. It is somewhat related to the violence, and it's not possible to uh, fail to talk about the issues that have to do with that. What would reforming this policy mean? Would it mean less violence or no? I think that's one of the most important questions we need to be able to answer, uh, if it's a moral issue or not. People uh, judge and approach the issue in different ways. But at the end of the day, I think we're going to have to see how does this help the situation in the region? How does it help uh, to have uh, legalization such as they've adopted in Uruguay? We don't, don't yet know how that's going to work. The various presidential candidates in Uruguay have said they're going to review that policy. But the idea is to minimize violence and to minimize illicit trafficking and all of the illicit businesses that stem from the drug trafficking uh, business and transnational crime. Those are the most important issues there and uh, still remains to be seen. Among other things, the president of Colombia, Juan Manuel Santos, at the Somebody of the Americas in Cartagena, raised the issue of legalization. He said that the drug war was like riding on a stationary bicycle. And we have to recognize Santos' gesture because there have always been many political leaders who, when they were president, didn't say anything. But when they were ex-presidents, they uh, came out with strong positions on the issue. Mark Bassett's uh, another issue, simple question. What happens, what about Washington policy toward Venezuela with the Republican victory? I think the rhetoric will harden, but I don't think that there will be a substantial change in U.S. policy to Venezuela. Of the issues we've been discussing, immigration, Cuba, drug policy, the domestic policy issues. I think that U.S. foreign policy to Latin America and I don't see this happen anywhere else. It doesn't happen with Europe, Asia, Africa, Middle East. They're all domestic policy issues because Latin America is also the United States, I think. And I in Venezuelan policy, one could only expect that in a Senate which has power and leverage in foreign policy, there will be a tough tone, a tougher tone. The same with Cuba. I don't think there will be a uh, change. There was a consensus among the Democrats in the Foreign Relations Committee on issues such as Cuba or Venezuela. Now, let me say something about Venezuela. The sanctions uh, that were passed by Senators Rubio and Menendez to have a framework set of sanctions. Senator Reid never wanted to give voice or vote any time in the plenary for discussing that. That could change. <laughs> and that will depend in large measure on what happens in Venezuela over the next three to six months. I see that perhaps differently. 
but in general, I agree with what you've said, which is to say that these issues, and now we, we say intermestic in English, they're both international and domestic policy issues. And that's one of the reasons why we're hosting this event, because these are uh, issues that are relevant for the peoples of Latin America and for the people of the United States. Carl, who know, you know the Senate, and I imagine that there will be a debate where there's talk of adopting sanctions with Venezuela. Uh, do you really think there will be a debate on sanctions when there's now such robust trade in oil with Venezuela and Republicans like business? Well, the United States, Canada are producing more energy than ever, and that is going to have an impact on public policy. I know it's already having an impact on our public policy towards the Middle East, and I think that that will also happen with Venezuela. Now, what makes this even more relevant is the whole issue of the Keystone Pipeline and the ratification or the decision of the U.S. government to allow uh, the construction of this huge uh, pipeline, which would run from the United States all the way through the United S uh, from Canada all the way through the United States. But once again, it's an issue of energy security. Uh, Venezuela is part of that discussion. But more than anything, I would say that given the levels of production that exist at this time, the dynamic of these decisions in terms of how they would view Venezuela is changing. And I think that that is going to be part of a consensus, perhaps. And I think uh, Republicans and Democrats see it that way. I think it's more likely that they would uh, put pressure on that issue differently, depending on what happens in Venezuela. But for Maduro, it would be great for U.S. policy to toughen, where he could blame an enemy with uh, conspiracy theories uh, on an enemy that's much more vocal than in recent years. I think that specific sanctions with a scalpel instead of with a machete, as has been done in other situations, is the key to that. If it is applied well, then I think it's less likely that President Maduro would be able to respond in that way. Will there be a change, if there's a change, in, uh, or on the question of change in Washington policy to Venezuela, New York Times editorials have called for a toughening of uh, White House policy to uh, the government of Nicolás Maduro. The big issue is the juggling we've seen at the high-level persons at the State Department. When there are hearings and they're cornered and they say, why don't you do more, the response is because we don't want to be too tough with Maduro because he will then accuse us of being the instigators, those who are behind this conspiracy. But I agree with Carl. I think that the only possible way out here would be intelligent, effective surgical operations that are based on context that can be perfectly well understood by everyone, human rights. Well, the thing is, there are stories in Venezuela of political prisoners, journalists who've been persecuted, where one must w raise one's voice. Indeed, how many times have we complained because no country of Latin America has raised its voice in a strong enough way to denounce such things. Well, the case of Mexico, well, that's the Estrada Doctrine. Or as President Benito Juarez said, respect for others is peace. But in the case of issues such as this that cry to the skies, uh, human rights, political rights, I think uh, quite a bit could be done from the United States. And what would such surgical measures look like? Well, there are figures within the Venezuelan government who are in the army who are either committing abuses against human rights or involved in drug trafficking. And uh, a clear sign, a cl clear signal could be sent to people who are involved in that sort of activity is the best way of dealing with that. Let us also recall that this has a great deal to do with our policy to Colombia. And we want to see that the great strides we've made in Colombia, with Colombia, we were a small part. I think uh, Plan Colombia was very important, but the lion's share of the work was done by Colombia. Most of the sweat, the investment, the people who have died have been Colombians. But we don't want to see those uh, policies to move backwards and that the problem uh, be shifted from Colombia to Venezuela. I think that's an important 
issue as regards uh, U.S. security in the region. And that's why I think it's more likely that we'll see a more intelligent way of dealing with this issue. Two final questions before opening up to the public. One for you, Carl. What could happen after yesterday's result with U.S.-Argentina relations, which have been tense with President Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner and with Brazil? Recall Dilma Rousseff canceled an official visit to Washington after it was discovered that uh, as they, well, that her, she was being wiretapped. As regards Argentina, I think most of the people are looking at what is coming. There's the question of the vulture funds and the president of Argentina has her position on that issue. I would hope that progress could be made because it would be good for Argentina, for investment in Argentina, and so on. Argentina is uh, going through a very difficult economic situation, a bad economic situation, and to send a signal that they're willing to work with the international financial community is important for investment and for the Argentine economy. But I think that people now, at least in the United States, are beginning to look at what is coming, the coming elections, the candidates, and there, I think, they'll begin to take another position as regards Argentina. As uh, for Brazil, I think that the Brazilians understand that they need to adopt economic reforms. The Brazilian economy is not uh, having its best moment either. The president's victory was a very close race in which it was shown that Brazil is a polarized country. But I think that the president understands that she's going to have to improve the economic situation. The United States is interested. It's willing to improve the economic relationship. There are certain political issues that are part of this discussion. But I think that beginning to build trust, uh, developing a better understanding, a better relationship as between the governments of the United States and Brazil, well, perhaps a visit by President Dilma Rousseff. She said that she's willing to come to the United States. Something like that would allow an opportunity to do something more specific. I think that a, a bilateral tax treaty as between the two countries is something that's important. The Brazilian financial sector wants it. The commercial sector of the United States wants it as well. Though I think it's less likely that these things would be done in the next two years. But beginning such a conversation, such a process, would, I think, be important. I don't think that anybody here thinks that Latin America is a priority for the United States uh, at this time. If, uh, it's, it uh, suffices to hear the last couple of State of the Union addresses by Obama. And uh, there might just be tangential mention of Latin America. Latin America is not a priority for the United States. We all have to accept it. There is a disguised uh, uh, an issue which is really a domestic issue for the United States, dressed up as a foreign policy issue, which is immigration. And then there are isolated actions, but there's not a specific policy. There's not a priority. This country has many priorities. It was emerging from a huge economic recession. It doesn't have money to give Latin America. It uh, has to dealing with huge-scale conflicts in other parts of the world. But even if there's a war, or unless there's a war in a Latin American country, I don't think this uh, reality is going to change. I don't know if that's good or bad. The ironic thing about all this, as Mooney says, and quite rightly so, is that, in effect, there is an absence. The United States thinks it's uh, Iraq, Syria, their uh, sexier issues. We're going to uh, support human rights, uh, the government of al -Abari. But then, out of the blue, uh, children began arriving at the border from Central America. And they said, how has this happened? Where is this coming from? And one realizes that the reality is always a step ahead. And the United States, because of ignoring the situation in the hemisphere, always ends up with surprises such as this, which sometimes put the United States in check. It's incredible that most of the Central American children, that these uh, children, Central American children have cornered the United States. They didn't know what to do. And apparently Homeland Security had no idea. The White House was like a chicken with its head cut off, uh, saying, what do we do? How can we communicate with these governments that we practically don't speak with and tell them, try to contain this. Mexico, please uh, have surveillance at your southern border. Control your southern border. And Central, Ameri and Central America says, well, it's a chaotic situation. I told you, no. The uh, head of the Northern Command had indicated this from some time. And uh, it had been ignored because of the great focus on the Middle East. 
One final question for a quick uh, response as to then give the floor to the public. What is best for Latin America in a presidential election? That the Democrats win or that the Republicans win? Well, it's difficult. I'll answer last. I'm not sure what to answer. I don't think it matters from a historical standpoint, which you've described very well, where Latin America is less important for the United States, as you were saying, Muni. Uh, Obama doesn't even mention it, only mentions it very uh, tangentially in his State of the Union speeches. In his other speeches, Latin America never appears. I think that's good. The Iraqs or Syrians were in Latin America 20, 30 years ago, and that is why not all of the presidents, well, that's why all of the presidents would try to do something with respect to Latin America for their legacy. And they have not done this, like children and migrants aren't considered, the situation still is not considered as catastrophic as in other parts of the planet. I think the Democrats and Republicans operate in the geopolitical context in which they, uh, it is they've uh, experienced it, and I really don't think it's going to make much of a difference. Well, the, uh, if the option is between ignore or invade, which is by the pendulum in bilateral uh, relations, it's better to be ignored. It depends on which candidate and which party. And perhaps a candidate from the Tea Party wouldn't be advisable for Latin America, nor a candidate from the extreme uh, left. I think if it's Hillary or Jeb, it would be the same. I really don't think there's a big difference except for nuances, the truth of the matter is that in Latin America we have learned, we've always understood that the United States doesn't have friends, the United States has interests, and we've got become used to it. We're accustomed to this reality, and that's why it's just the same, whether it's uh, blue or red. Well, for the record, I am Republican. I would say the following. It's best to have a president who has a good understanding of just what the value of having good relationship with the region is. We're going through a very interesting situation in the region. It's extremely diverse. We have the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership, countries of the region that want to have a better defined profile in terms of trade with Asia. We have energy security in North America. And we have uh, Brazil, which wants to be a protagonist in worldwide. And we have to figure out a way of developing a relationship with this country. Now, this could be on the Republican side or the Democratic side. I would say the Republicans have been better defined in terms of what they want to get out of the region, free trade agreements. Now, we might need a much broader and uh, comprehensive policy, but thus far, Republicans have shown a much better defined position in terms of what they want to get out of the region and what the region means for them. I think we have a few more minutes to take some questions for the public. I don't know where the microphones are. Right here. My name is Jose Miguel Pulido. I uh, thank you for this uh, presentation. I wanted to ask once again about the sexy issues, even though Obama at the federal level uh, it might not be thought that Latin America is as important as uh, Ukraine. Governors Christie and Brown have traveled to Mexico, and there was a summit with President Peña Nieto in San Francisco on a state level. So of the new governors who have been elected yesterday, I would ask whether they're going to pursue those good relations with Latin America. And who is the question directed to? For Carl and anyone else who wants to answer. The particular question... It was what? Because you said several things. Whether the new governors are going to pursue a better relationship with Latin America. I was watching a, an interview with Governor Christie this morning where he was asked the following question. If the Republican Party could have the same kind of success as it has had in his state in terms of diversity and demographics in his state, he's been able to get more than 50% of the Hispanic vote and more than 23% of the African-American vote in New Jersey. I think that has a great deal to do with an understanding of what the region is going through and what the United States is going through right now. I think it is unsustainable for the Republican Party to not include that diversity of Americans who are going to be 
part of the majority of who we are as a country. It's not sustainable to have a regional policy. We need to have a policy that is also geared to all the different demographic groups of the country in order for it to be a complete policy that represents a, a critical mass of Americans. I think the Republicans understand that. I think the Democrats have not understood it in the last cycle. Well, Barack Obama won because he uh, had an advantage in all demographic groups in the country. The Republicans are understanding that, and perhaps they understand it more than in other elections. I think that Governor Bush, uh, had, w when he became president, had major support from Hispanics. Romney declined in this respect. But it's not going to be possible to win elections pretty soon without having a diverse uh, group in those who vote for a given candidate. It's an interesting question because traditionally, that's what I call the uh, two-way promenade of politicians. When Mexican politicians, be they, whether they're from the PRI, the PAN, when they want to consolidate their status as state person, what they do is they go through Washington. They come to Washington and they visit the think tanks, politicians, a lot of photos are taken. And U.S. politicians are now beginning to do the same thing. You can see Hillary Clinton traveling to Mexico when, uh, at the time of the presidential election and even going to uh, pray at the Basilica of Guadalupe. John McCain likewise. Be why? Because they understand that Mexico and the United States has this uh, two-way street. So even though there's a wall dividing the two countries, the Hispanic electorate counts and it counts a lot. So they're getting more and more accustomed to making these uh, trips, including to the Basilica of Guadalupe, to see if the Virgin of Guadalupe can help them with their votes. And this helps to confirm what Carl calls this new intermestic politics question. Interesting, many of these governors have made two trips to Mexico and to Israel. These are the trips that governors make in order to uh, strengthen their national stature. Any other questions? Right here. Who wants to answer? The question has to do with whether the outcome in the congressional vote is going to have an impact on financing for various countries in the region, right? For development spending for different countries. In terms of the region, I would tell you in terms of the region, I would tell you that the budget for Latin America has dropped from about $2 billion four years ago to $1.5 billion now. The budget priorities in general have been Colombia, Haiti, and Mexico, and that has uh, held constant for a long time. I think that's not going to change. The emphasis of U.S. foreign policy to the region has not been development. It has been more related to drug trafficking, reconstruction in Haiti, and to uh, see a fruitful conclusion of the process in Colombia. The last times Kerry has appeared, there are fewer and fewer resources. Democratic congressmen such as Henry Cuellar at the same time the State Department is conducting audits in several 
U.S. embassies in Latin America, including in Mexico, to see how to cut the budget. So how deep into its pockets does uh, the United States have to go to pay its own staff as well as Thank you. I'm Virginia gonzalez Gas. I'm a legislator for the Socialist Party of Argentina. And I was wondering whether from now forward, the ambassador who's been, uh, who we haven't had for a year is going to be appointed. We haven't had an ambassador for over a year. We had a meeting at the State Department, and that's one of the questions for in order to resolve the conflictive situation that we have, it would be good for an ambassador to be appointed. This relationship notwithstanding, there are commercial relationships with Chevron and so on in Argentina. But I think there are more than 60 ambassadors who have not been designated. And there have been some not very fruitful statements on the part of the uh, charge d'affaires in charge of the embassy in Argentina. So I wanted to ask about that. Well, that's a very big problem, as you said. There are more than 60 nominees who have not been ratified by the U.S. Congress. I think that the best thing that the new Republican majority could do to clearly show that in a Republican Congress things will get done would be to uh, reform that sort of thing. We cannot be the strongest country in the world with the largest economy in the world and the strongest army and not have a representation or a top-level representative in the various countries. It's really a shame. It's shameful that we've gone through this moment of not having ambassadors in so many things where so many things are happening, not just in Latin America, also in certain parts of Africa, where the Ebola crisis is unfolding, and also in certain parts of Asia, where we, there's a policy that we're trying to uh, give greater, ever greater emphasis to. I think that the new Republican ma majority would do very well to begin with something positive, because this is going to be the perception. They're going to have to clearly show that they're different from what we've seen in the past and on making uh, such a change. Well, I, I think such a change would be consistent with that. The thing is, excuse me, this obstructionism on the part of the Republican Party, which is shameful, is also reflects a reality, which is that in recent years, President Obama has appointed any number of people who have few credentials to occupy the positions but who have been major donors, who don't know the region, who don't have the proper training. So part of the agenda, no doubt, and it will worsen, is will be to put, put the brakes on what the president presents to Congress. Yet at the same time, it's a time to pay favors, and there are some appointments that are shameful. One final question, if somebody has a final question. My name is Lourdes Bautista. I'm working with the Heritage Foundation. My question is for all of you. In terms of Central America, which party, Democrat or Republican, could play a more effective role in fighting corruption in Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, and likewise the struggle against violence, these being the factors that are aggravating the situation and to fueling immigration. Who wants to answer? Jaime? I'd like to answer with an anecdote. There was a meeting in New York when Hillary Clinton was still Secretary of State. The purpose of the meeting with some representatives of the European Union was precisely to see how the European Union could lean forward with money in particular to see how they could uh, support the whole region. And one of the key 
or star problems uh, that was proposed by Hillary Clinton was a high security prison, to build a high security prison. And the Europeans, the Germans said, a prison? Why a prison? Why not go for social programs? That's the origin of so many of the problems. That's why there's so much immigration. That's why these countries have such high uh, rates of expelling population. That's why they're divided uh, countries that have, because of this terrible trip that many make through Mexico, and one always reaches the same conclusion. The United States, be it Democrats or Republicans, well, until they see the whole region from a less police-informed uh, and a less uh, lens, with less militariz with the view towards militarization and more with the view towards development, then there will be some des desperation. But w but uh, uh, the times have been hard. The economic crisis. It would be desirable, but I'm quite skeptical. Let's hope. Does anyone want to add uh, something? Well, dealing with corruption, dealing with governability or governance, lack of employment, security, dealing with the factors that contribute to this discussion, including drug consumption in the United States, and also dealing with the issues that have to do with laws that facilitate people coming to the United States and staying in the United States, even though it's illegal. All those things need to be reformed. I agree with you. It's not just dealing with corruption, which is a big topic, a big issue. And the other issue, which we didn't have with Colombia, and which is why Plan Colombia was successful, the willingness on the part of the Colombian leaders to fight drug trafficking and to fight transnational crime, they were clearly committed to it. And we don't have that with the Central American leaders now. I think that all of those things together have to be part of this conversation. I think there's a willingness on the Republican side to deal with a lot of these things, but there's also a willingness on the part of the Democrats to deal with uh, issues as well. And it has to be joint. It has to be a bilateral policy if it's really going to work. Our time has run out. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for having been here. Jose Jaime uh, Hernandez, Mark Bassetz, Carl Meacham for having uh, Muni Jensen.